Alabama was a very special stop with a very special guest. Uh, I was fortunate enough to interview Nelson Malden, an active participant in the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s, and the personal barber of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Nelson has been a barber almost all of his life. Uh, little did he know when he opened up shop in Montgomery, Alabama in the early 1950s that he was going into business in what would become the cradle of the American civil rights movement. His shop was around the corner from Martin Luther King's home, which was the White House you saw at the beginning of the video. Nelson attended and graduated from Alabama State University and was a member of the Dexter Avenue King Memorial Church. As a civil rights advocate, he participated in the now seminal Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 and the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965, all while serving as a barber and friend of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, so I talked with Nelson about these topics and more and would like to thank him in advance for being willing to do the interview. So let's talk to Nelson Malden. So if you want to just introduce yourself and tell us about yourself. Okay. My name is, uh, you, you ready? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nelson Malden. Yeah. I was born in Monroe, Alabama in uh, November 8, 1933. I'm the youngest of seven brothers. And my mother and mother and father was in school when I was one month old. So basically I came to Alabama, back to Alabama in 1952 to attend Alabama State College. I was a student, and that's when I got the first chance to cut my little pain here in 1954. Okay. In 19, I came to Montgomery in 52, the boycott yeah. started in 55. Okay. Yeah, I was there way before it started. Yeah, and, and did you participate in the boycott? Yeah, too. Yeah, well, every black person basically in Montgomery mm -hmm. participated. Yeah. But what part we played was another question. We uh, all participated. Yeah. Uh, we marched with some of the students uh, downtown. But and one of the funny things happened to the boycott, we wondered where the boycott went away. When it called for the smoke to scale the bus just for one day in support of Mrs. Parks going to court. So in the bottle shop we worked in then, it was in 1954, we moved to Penn Fifth Eight. And so we saw this black, the other boy cop, we saw this black man standing on the corner across from the bottle shop. And everybody wondered where the boy cop went away. So we saw this man had on his trench coat and his hat. And so the bus pulled up, the bus was empty, the bus pulled up, and all the customers in the shop went to the one to see where the man was going to get on the bus. And so the bus pulled on off, the man was still standing. We hollered, <laughs> we hollered so loud. We said, <laughs> oh, nice. Joe Lewis said, not that nice now. Yeah. <laughs> so well, then we said, they wait, they wait. You know, that was the first incident of the boycott. That was the very first day. And uh, with the movement, it was just a day by day, moment by moment step. And they were very, after we saw the results of what we was doing, we got some of the results from it. So we felt, I felt real good, yeah. you know, that people, that people stayed off the bus. And we was organized. See, the first time we ever been that unified in Montgomery, especially the black people, was through the bus boycott. That would make it so famous. But what made the boycott such an outstanding thing? So every black people said, how did the black people in Montgomery, Alabama, stay to yell for 381 days without any problem? Well, if you had been there during that time, every black person that had ever been on that bus had been insulted and humiliated by that bus driver. And that bus driver named was Blake. And he was saying that most of the bus line, you do not have a problem. My teacher was, she was one of the organizers of the boycott, had me, she taught English, to get on the bus down to the terminal, Court Square, and ride to Capitol High School to predominant white. That was no problem, but if one bus man and if I was six black ladies would made history. Uh, Susan McDonald, Mary Louise Smith, uh, Aretha uh, Brown, and uh, Claudia Carl. So I was, what happened is just a gradual thing, but we felt good as the results came in, you know, because the city tried to negotiate with some of the civil rights people, but the, 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 the civil rights organized here in Montgomery, they said, they told the city, call the park out all, and uh, we negotiate. So the city said, well, we negotiate with you if y'all stop the park out. But they were able to get together mm -hmm. on that first tactic, so the park out just kept going, yeah. one day, another day, another day, another day. Yeah, it was eventually successful. Which is, oh, yeah. when the Supreme Court ruled, yeah, yeah. Uh, when the Supreme the Broward of Western Gale, that was the case with the United States Supreme Court. It was yeah. not ruled upon. The, the, yeah. the term is fairly developed if you use Broward, mm -hmm. particular case, and you use this part. Yeah. yeah. What was your experience like with it? I mean, was, well, was it a pain for you? I mean, oh, it was very rewarding to see the man standing on the corner. That was just something see him standing yeah. on the corner yeah. when the bus passed, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I said, well, it was what? I mean, because we've been struggling. Well, the boycott basically was just uh, it was a lot of people in, throughout the country think that all the bus lines in Montgomery had a problem. But basically, it was one bus line that had a problem. You had a large black population on the east side of town. You had a large black population on the west side of town. 
and you had a small white population in the center of town, the Bible told these malls and all that was established. So everything was downtown, all the department stores, these lawyers buildings, the doctors buildings, the dentists and all that was centered downtown and the state capital. Yeah. So consequently, there was not enough black people on the east side of town to take care of the rich white people in Cloverdale. Cloverdale was the plan community where the rich people lived, the Demon Brothers, the Wheels, the yeah. Lawyers, the Judges, and the Doctors. So they had to transport people from the east. Uh, west side of town to come to the east side to take care of the people in Clover there, which was a laid out plan community. Yeah. But, the, but the bus driver was assigned to that particular line. He was like one of the most hostile bus drivers in the usual city. I think he particularly was designed to keep all the owners up. Yeah. So anyway, the bus, you know, it had a, a black water fountain, you had a white water fountain. That's clear cut. Black drink got a black water fountain, yeah. white drink got a white water fountain. But on the bus, the bus driver had he could shift the race as he saw fit. So in the back, the back, the back the black was in the back. So the black person could actually give up that seat. The audience, the audience, the city audience had paid. If a black person actually give up that seat, that must be an available seat back for black. Yeah. Or if a white person actually give up that seat, that must be an available seat from white. But the day Ms. Paul got on the bus, everybody was in the proper racial seat. But the bus driver they had some of the two white women standing and the one white man. So they had the two black men to get up. And they got up, which it was supposed to move, to get the two white women to see. Yeah. Then after this pause, to get up, get a white man to see, and she refused. So then the rest of the show, the bus boycott started to last for 381 days. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, that's a long time with no public transportation. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because what we had transportation because once the city organized, got organized into transportation, you know, they got cartoons and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like so it wasn't that much much of a pain. People just carpooled and once well, once it got started, yeah, and once it got in place, a week or so, it was kind of painful because people, you know, had no transportation because they was all the stuff and most stuff and Yeah. But after the second or third weekend, it was start getting more organized. Then they had carpooled, then they tacked it, be a little cut, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know. So, I mean, you lived through the civil rights movement. You were in the heart of it in Montgomery in the 50s and then the 60s. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, the civil rights movement seems to have had a big impact on your life. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I was just curious, was there ever a moment when you realized as you were going through these things that you were living in such an influential part of history? Yeah, I had no idea whatsoever that we were, history was in the making. Yeah. For example, I knew the model Luther King would be as famous as well. I made all kinds of pictures. <laughs> but guess what happened? I didn't make the first picture. But the man said, head in the Bible chair. You know? yeah. But we had no idea that this much history was going to make it. Just, it was a gradual thing. They, they, when, when it was all over, then people looked back, then it's, ooh, that's a lot of history. See. So what was that? I mean, what was that like for you to go from you're in an area where it's sort of it's foundational and then it grows to be this national movement and you're, you're in a sort of a unique um, situation there because you're cutting the hair of maybe the most influential and famous person involved and he goes from being just a pastor at a local church to a national icon. What is that? What was that like for you? Well, I would have been right. In most, I was sarcastic. From the very first time I cut his hair, yeah. but I had a 10 o'clock class that morning. It was 9.30. I was standing in front of the barber shop. Mm -hmm. I saw this blue pointy hat drive up. I looked at my watch. I said, it's 9.30. And I looked at, but I never let him cut another head after 15 minutes to the hour because I had to walk to the campus, which about a half a block away. Yeah. So this young man got out of the car, looked at his head, I saw, heck, I could knock him out in 15 minutes. <laughs> so he came in the shop, like do most cuss, we asked him that name, he asked him the name, he said, Mark Luther King, I said, where are you from? He said, I enjoy that. I said, what are you doing in town? He said, I'm here to preach my trial Sunday at Dexter. Oh, I said, oh, that's my church. He said, good to meet you. Yeah. So after I cut his hair, I gave him the mirror, he said, like, it's half cut. And he said, pretty good. So you know when you tell a Bible pretty good, that's kind of an insult. <laughs> yeah. But he came back two weeks later, the other Bible was vacant. I was busy, but he waited on me. So I remember, I said, that must have been a pretty good after. He said, you're all right. <laughs> so, I, so after I cut his hair seven, eight times, I was just playing with him this time. I thought, you were a little psychotic on me. Yeah. I said, because he never gave me a tip. <laughs> and so I said, Rev, I said, when you finish preaching a sermon on Sunday, and some member tell you what a good sermon, I said, doesn't that make you feel good? He said, yeah. I said, you go to the restaurant, you have a nice meal, and the waiter gives you a good service, and you give her a tip. I said, don't you think that makes her feel good? He said, yeah. So he didn't say anything else. By the next five minutes, I didn't say anything. He got out of the chair, he grabbed my hand, and he held real tight. He said, do you put 10% of your own in the church? I said, Rev, I'm a student at Alabama State College. I cannot afford to put 10% of my own in the church. Yeah. He said, I'm the pastor next day. I'm the pastor of church, and I can't afford to tip you either. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of relationship we basically had. Yeah. 
just pretty familiar in banter and whatever he said. At what point, you know, he became sort of a national figure and famous sort of before your eyes. What was that like to be a part of that? Well, what happened, the building you're in now, uh, we have a night club up on the top floor of this building. Mm -hmm. Reverend King was unknown basically except at the church that he was called to, Dexter. And so he had agreed to speak to the father and son banquet. And, and for then, but in the meantime, he had been elected to be the first president of the Muslim Improvement Association. See how he got elected to be the first president was that Rufus Lewis and E. D. Nixon. They were at odds with each other. One felt that black people had the right to vote, one said black people go to court. So the two black ladies got together and told the two black men, we'd be better if we had one organization to have it too. Yeah. So if we, would you agree for the election that one of you become the first president of the Muslim Improvement Association? And they agreed. Yeah. But Mr. Lewis knew Reverend King, he was a member of Reverend King Church and also a member of Reverend King fraternity. He knew this young man would be better than either one of them. So to put his name in nomination, he put Martin Luther King's name in nomination. Mm -hmm. So what Reverend King got to be known was at Hope Street Church that night when he gave his acceptance speech to become the first president of the Muslim Improvement Association. And one old lady in the audience said, Oh Lord, you have sent us a savior. That was the beginning of his fame. Yeah. At Hope Street Church. So how, you know, going from that to giving a speech in front of the the uh, right. Lincoln Memorial on the mall in front of, you know, millions of people and giving the I Have a Dream speech. What was it like to to, to see him on the television or to see that national notoriety after having grown out of this neighborhood? Well, what happened, uh, when he first came to Montgomery, uh, we were voting on him to become council, the yeah. church. But, so one day they voted against the other came to become council. Mm -hmm. So the chairman of the deacon vote, we want to have a solid block vote without any dissenters. So the lady said, she, uh, Mr. Nancy said, what's your problem? She said that, First thing, this church needed a more seasoned cop. Said this fellow has never had a church before. Yeah. He's still in school. Said we need somebody more seasoned, that more experienced. And so, so they kept pushing lady for her to change her vote, but she wouldn't change. So they made her mad. So yeah. she got up and walked out and meeting. She said, "Cause the reason I'm not gonna vote for him, cause I don't want that young boy preaching to me." Yeah. And so Reverend King was told that, but he was never saying anything about the whole six years he was at Dexter. Yeah. And so, but we won the Nobel Peace Prize back in the late '60s. The church invited him back. Well, Alan Frank was son, but he brought his peace prize with him. So he got in the pulpit. The first thing he said, I was a little boy then, but I'm a big boy now. So, then in the speech he gave, I have a dream. See, this is Mahalia Jackson who let him give a speech before. But someone had to write the first part of the speech. So Mahalia knew he was not at his best in the first part of the speech. So she told him to put the dream in that box, put the dream, because she had heard some similar a sermon like that before he had preached. Mm -hmm. So that's when he put the green in there, and that's what made the fame. Okay, cool. yeah. okay, cool. But I, when I met him, so he came back about here about two or three weeks before he went to Memphis, Tennessee. I was cut down the front chair. So him and my brother were sitting out in the room. Yeah. And uh, before he came back here, before he went against the war in Vietnam, we would see the little white boy parked in front of the shop. Yeah. And so we didn't know what the little white boy. We know it was rare to see a little white, two or three white boy parked in the car on Jackson Street. Yeah. So when he left, the white boy left. About a month or two later, he came back by the barber shop. And we see a little white boy parked right there. And so we just still didn't associate that with security or somebody's spying. We didn't know who the little white boy was, but we know it was strange to see that on the street yeah. in this black neighborhood. And so my brother assumed that it was security. So my brother, when he was in the one of my brothers, said, where's your security? And I thought, we can see the little white boys when he, made, when he went against the war in Vietnam. You know, he said the war was in all all that yeah. 80 percent of infantry, uh, was four white boys and black boys fighting. And so, but then when he came back by the last time, two or three weeks before he went to Memphis, Tennessee, my brother had to wear social security. He said, man, I'm stairs with me now. <laughs> yeah. So I guess we know something. We don't know where that but we assume that it was security. Yeah. yeah. So even though he was definitely in 1960, uh, when he came back, many times after he came back to Montgomery, he would live with his good friend, Richmond Smiley, in Mobile Heights, that's a southern uh -huh. And so that they uh, jumped on him and said he had been assassinated, he had been killed. And I was cutting Richmond down. And so uh, the telephone rang and the lady asked, said, Richmond asked, said, yes, he's in the chair. said, Tony Rowe came, been assassinated, he fell out of the chair. He was his good friend. And also his attorney brother. Yeah. What was that like for you? Oh, it was heartbreaking, you know. Uh, we, you know, I knew him all that time. I cut it down, and I did give him a mustache shape and uh, lined his makeup before he went, went up to Memphis that particular time. Yeah. Um, 
most of the churches, see, I think three of the children are born on the street. Everybody was born on the street except Bernice. She was born in Atlanta in 1963. Yeah. Huh? What was, I mean, what was the, when you, when you heard the news that he had been assassinated, what was, I mean, what was your your reaction? Was like, the, what was the community's reaction? Were they Ooh, just was sad, sad, anger? Anger, anger. sad, you know, a lot of burning, a lot of looting, and uh, reactions of South Macon. Yeah. He was a real love person you know, throughout, the, throughout the country. You know, uh, you know I wanted to ask you too uh, about the Selma March, especially now, you know, they made that movie about it, and there's been, since the anniversary, there's been a lot of uh, talk about it in the news, and like you mentioned on CBS and things. What was your experience with the Selma March? Well, the 7th of March was, uh, well, I think it's all Jose Weed's nephew was killed in Marion, Alabama, Jimmy D. Jackson. They were supposed to bring his body back to Alabama, Montgomery, to dramatize and justice for, for black people in Alabama. But the march was supposed to last march for 10 hours a day. And it was women and children picked up and kept back to the first 20 hours. And they swam. So when Mr. Vala Luther was killed, I guess that was Congress, Linda Johnson had told him, Reverend King, about what he asked for the voting right bill, and Lennon Johnson, man, you just got your civil right bill in 1964. You think the Congress, and this Congress is going to give you a bill back to back like that? Yeah. It's quick. And he said that, uh, so when Ms. Val Luther was killed, I think that helped change the, the Congress feeling because there's a white lady being killed, yeah. waiting for civil rights for black people by hauling bribes back and forth to Selma. Yeah. But the Selma march was very historical that night when the marchers came in. I lived not too far from the last campsite. And we had to have that find it, Joan Baez, uh, Tony Bennett, uh, <laughs> Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah. All got entertained. Yeah. The march was coming in. Yeah. So when, when, uh, when, when he came out on the stage, he said, I left my heart in San Francisco, but I found my soul in the house. It took 15 <laughs> minutes to get the people quiet. Yeah. yeah, that was a very historical cool. day. We had a very enjoyable time. <laughs> yeah, it's the next morning, we, we met we met them downtown, mm -hmm. and we marched from the, the square up to uh, State Capitol. And I was standing right by Ralph Bunch. And so Reverend King tried to get Ralph Bunch to come up to the platform at that particular time. And Ralph Bunch hollered back there. You see, Ralph, Reverend King had the microphone, but Ralph Bunch didn't have the microphone, but he hollered, Go ahead, Martin, this is your day. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. That's when he gave his famous speech, you know, how yeah. long? Not long. Yeah. And George Wallace, we, we see George Wallace, he was, he was the governor, so he was on this side of the star right there, we could see him went on that other side. Yeah. See, George Wallace had seen his uh, <clears throat> highway director down the cell and turned the marks around, but he yeah. didn't tell him what to do. Yeah. But when he shot the tear gas and the horses and the TV cameras, really what made it, because they did more horrifying things to black people than that, beating on the grid. Yeah. But with the TV cameras, man, that made a big yeah, thing. Yeah, live on television. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't like the same thing, the like K-9 dogs in the fire holes in Birmingham. Yeah. That was that was the thing. The television camera played a real major part in putting, you know, the picture worth more than a thousand yeah. words. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I did want to talk about this because you've lived through some of the most severe racial tension in, in the history of the United States. And when you look at the news today, uh, there's a lot of racial tension in the news when you with things like Ferguson uh, and the riots in Baltimore and uh, you know the Trayvon Martin shooting and there's all sorts of uh, news stories of tensions, it seems like, racial tensions nationwide. I was just curious if you feel like the things that you experienced in the 50s and 60s, if there's any, do you feel any correlation or any, any relation between those things happening then and these things happening now? Well, I guess in the South, we had segregated laws. You know, the laws tell you where you go, what you can do, until 1964 when the laws changed, you know, for public accommodation. Mm -hmm. But in Vegas and in Baltimore, the other cities looked like it was just some policemen haven't been out of control, you know, shooting, uh, you know, like, like that. If there's such a man running from the back, turning to you, run away from him, yeah. it was like a more horrifying than some incident that took place uh, in the South. But there were two different types of circumstances. One yeah. was segregated laws, where the law regulated where you're going not go. Mm -hmm. And then in Baltimore, it's just not police brutality. Yeah. You know, you know, taking advantage of the poor people. Yeah. Uh, see, the South was. Where I remember some of the debates we had in the bomb shot when uh, Reverend King asked the social so professor from the Alpine Institute. So they had a good debate standing right again. So Reverend King said, moral force in the universe is one of the strongest forces. And the social professor from the Alpine said, I think it's economics and capital. He said, the European white man came to this country. So the first thing he did was build some of the top universities and the new heritage to educate himself to Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Then when 
Then the maid got the oranges in Florida. Stop no sugar, got the sugar cane and lose down. When Standard Oil got oil in Texas. When Philip Moss got the doctor in Virginia. The Gallo got the grapes in California. Next thing they built was Wall Street to control the capital. Yeah. And the last thing they built was built West Point to defend it. He said that is the United States of America. Yeah. So that's when Bill T. lost that debate that day. He shook the man <laughs> Well, I mean, my last, I, I, I just got one last question for you, and it was just, you know, thinking about um, the current events that I just mentioned and, and what you've been through historically, do you feel like the civil rights movement is still alive today? I think we, we gained a lot from the civil rights movement. I think we lost some also. Segregation, you take the example of my number, we was all forced to live together. Mm -hmm. it, during that time of segregation, it came whether you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you're a professor, whatever. You, if you were black, you lived in the same community. And I think that had a positive impact effect on especially black children, but all of the educated blacks with income moved to the dominant so-called integrated neighborhood, then it left a whole lot of blacks in like a ghetto type uh, situation. Yeah. But I think, but but you had the right to move, I think that was positive though. People want to move to a better neighborhood than the Madonna's black neighbor during that time, so we couldn't go against that, you know, yeah. in order. But I think progress was made, you know, the black University of Alabama schools and uh, but, but I think Alabama had a problem, see, back in Montgomery, uh, we got three universities, that's the 15,000 students. But based all of them were for racial reasons. I think if we just had a, a tax base, cannot afford that and give you a real quality education like you do some of the other cities in the country. But I think, uh, you know, they had a lot of bands, you know, came out, so we got a voting right bill, we got a black drug, you know, now you got a black female attorney general. To get rid of Clarence Stone, we have a good coat. <laughs> but I don't think they can get rid of Clarence Stone. I know the other day, you know, one of them voted against this uh, immigration or something like that. I forget what it was, but he voted all the other eight who <laughs> voted for it. <laughs> I said, well, God, I said, well, God, help a bill that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate your time. So that was my interview with Nelson Malden, uh, who I think has such an interesting perspective on a very important period in American history. Uh, because as a country, I think we've made Martin Luther King into this mythical hero, hero, and I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I think it's interesting to hear the perspective of a man who knew him as just another barbershop customer. It's also interesting to contemplate the civil rights movement with someone who lived through it and was an active part of it. And I also think, you know, it's interesting to think about race relations both then and today. Uh, we have a tendency, I think, in American history to think of race relations as something that sort of struggled from the beginning of the country, and then we fought a war over it in the 1860s, and then 100 years later we had a social movement to change uh, any lingering racial tensions or discrimination. But then now it's o the, the, then okay. Well, then now it's over that after the civil rights movement in the 1960s that race relations are healed. Uh, and I think you know, the tragedy that happened this week in Charleston, uh, or the riots in Baltimore, or in Ferguson, or the dozens of other cases uh, just this year uh, of negative race relations, I think at least warrant a re-examination of where we're at, uh, and definitely a re-examination of the history of, of race relations. As always, if you want to understand the present, You've got to understand historical um, foundations. So uh, I've got a, some questions above. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Stay posted for a response and more videos.